So hereafter, we'll not, we'll drop the pretense of this phi acting on a finite dimensional vector space V, which is abstract, and we'll just deal with matrices. Because we'll say, okay, if it's finite dimensional, just get, go for an ordered basis, transform things like operators to just matrices, all right? So we'll just talk about matrices now and their eigenvalues and see what we can do with them, all right? So suppose A, so we'll treat it like it's a matrix in over the field of complex numbers, okay? Having R, which is of course less than or equal to N. See, why is this property important? We'll get to that shortly. We'll again revert to the problem of the dynamical system that we discussed the previous day, right after stating this. So what we are saying is, suppose A is a complex matrix of size n cross n having R. Of course, R cannot be more than n because a monic polynomial of degree n cannot have more than n roots, yeah? Distinct eigenvalues, say lambda 1 through lambda R. Then the corresponding eigenvectors, so when I say corresponding, if I write V1, you know it goes with lambda 1, V2 means goes with lambda 2 and so on. Hmm? V1, V2 till VR are linearly independent. A ready made extension of this would be if R is equal to N, we exactly have everything in our wish list. Is it not? Because if R is equal to N, then you recall in the previous day when we took this A and stacked up the V's and we said AV is equal to V times some diagonal matrix. The V needed to be non-singular because then we could write A as V inverse some A tilde V or something like that, right? We didn't call it A tilde, I think we called it some lambda. What I'm saying is that if you have A and if you have V1, V2 till Vn, then this matrix is going to be linearly, I mean this matrix is going to be non-singular if your eigenvalues are distinct, then this is definitely going to be non-singular. Of course, we still have to prove this. Let's assume we'll prove this, but this is going to be non-singular. If this is going to be non-singular, then we can write this as, sorry, V1, V2, Vn times this lambda 1, lambda 2 till lambda n, right? So now, if this is indeed V's are linearly independent, the VI's, then this is non, this is invertible, it is non-singular, and therefore what can we say? We can say that this lambda is exactly equal to, let's call this V, then we will have V inverse AV, and bingo, the result, right? So this, subject to our ability to prove this, we would have shown that if you have all your eigenvalues distinct, it's like a partial answer to our problem, right? If you take the determinant of A minus lambda I and if you happen to find that all your eigenvalues are distinct, you need to worry no further. You'll be able to solve that differential equation of degree N as if it were N first order differential equations, replicating exactly the steps we had shown. You'll obviously not be able to draw it like on a plane. That you can't do beyond 2D. But at least the solution methodology is very easy then, right? Okay. But here we are saying something else. We are saying that maybe you don't have all your n eigenvalues distinct. If there are distinct eigenvalues, the corresponding eigenvectors for those will always be linearly independent, okay? So let's try and see why this is so. So suppose n is equal to 1. 
well it is trivial right. So, we want to use induction. Suppose n is equal to 1, it is just a scalar you know what its eigenvalue is, it is the number itself. A scalar uh, operator is just a scaling a multiplication right. So, I am going to just write obviously true. I mean you take any number in the field that is that is the eigenvector. Any non-zero number in the field is an eigenvector. So, obviously any non-zero number is a non-zero vector is linearly independent ok. Let uh, it be ok, let us say let it be true for well actually you can just let this equal to r right because we are going to go for this r is equal to 1 case let r is equal to k so, the base right let it be true for r is equal to k. So, that if you have k linearly independent eigen uh, values so eigen k distinct eigen vectors then their eigen eigen values sorry then their eigen vectors are linearly independent right. So, sorry if you have one eigen value yeah but if it is one eigen value then how many eigen vectors can you have you cannot have more than one eigen vector no. Can you? I mean you can only have something in the span of that eigen vector. When yeah matrix can be any size, matrix can be any size, but let us say you have just one distinct eigen value yeah. So, then what happens that is exactly what we have taken no. If you have 3 by 3 and if you have one distinct eigen value that means there is only one eigen value. It is repeated n number of times. So, then you will have one eigen vector at least and that one eigen vector is non zero. So, it is linearly independent yeah just for one eigen yes it is just for 1. So, r is equal to 1. So, now we assume that this is true for r is equal to k ok. So, you have k distinct eigen values for which you have corresponding eigen vectors. So, that means summation c i v i i going from 1 through k is equal to 0 implies c i is equal to 0 for i is equal to 1 2 until k ok. Let lambda k plus 1 be distinct from lambda 1 lambda 2 till lambda k and an eigenvalue of a. So, we are going to expand the size now and we are going to say that ok at least up to the size k let us say we have this property that they are indeed linearly independent. If we can show it to be true for k plus 1 then we will be done ok. So, consider summation c i v i i going from 1 through k plus 1 is equal to 0 implying c k plus 1 v k plus 1 is equal to minus summation i going from 1 through k c i v i can c k plus 1 be equal to 0 and does it help our cause? If c k plus 1 is equal to 0 then of course, the other c's must also vanish because of our base step here. So, then we would have already shown that this is linearly independent. So, the only way that this can end up being linearly dependent set is if c k plus 1 is non 0. So, let us go ahead and divide by c k plus 1. we may assume c k plus 1 is not equal to 0. I hope I have given enough justification why. If we do assume c k plus 1 is equal to 0 there is nothing to prove here really. We are done. So, the only case arises the only case to be checked the interesting case arises when c k plus 1 is not equal to 0. 
right? So let's suppose CK plus 1 is not equal to 0, then what happens? We can divide this and we write VK plus 1 is equal to summation CI by CK plus 1 VI I going from 1 through K, all right? Let's hit it on both sides with A, shall we? So A VK plus 1 is equal to summation CI by CK plus 1 A VI I going from 1 through K. What is this? Since this is an eigenvector corresponding to lambda K plus 1, what can we write this as? So this means it is lambda K plus 1 V k plus 1 is equal to, what about the left hand side? C i lambda i V i upon, agreed that this is true? Same thing, these are all eigenvectors as well for lambda 1, lambda 2 till lambda k. So I am just going to replace A V i with lambda i V i. See this is the expression from there. So let us name this equation 1 and let us name this equation 2. <coughs> Sorry? Yeah, the minus sign does matter. Thank you. It does matter. Yeah. So here also you need that and here also you need that. Yeah. Yeah. If if I had anyway gone ahead, I would have just subtracted it. <laughs> but yeah, so this is true, right? 1 and 2. Suppose I multiply 1 with lambda k plus 1, okay, and subtract these two fellows. What do you think happens on the right hand side? So lambda k plus 1 into equation 1 minus equation 2 results in what? What happens on the left hand side? 0, right? Please ask if this is not clear. You are okay with this? See that is why I did not bother too much with the minus. If you are making the same mistake throughout, the mistakes nullify. But yeah, you are right. It should have the minus sign because that is how I have described it there. So this is minus and this. So what happens? 0 is equal to what? Look there is a lambda k plus 1 multiplying each of these v's now. But each of these are multiplied by distinct lambdas here. So what happens then? This is going to be summation. Again I can now drop the minus sign because there is a 0. Right? So we have c i upon c k plus 1 times lambda k plus 1 minus lambda i multiplying v i's. What do we know about the v i's at least as our base step of the induction? That it is linearly independent. So this can only vanish if these terms are all identically 0. Yeah. So that means we must have c i by c k plus 1 lambda k plus 1 minus lambda i is equal to 0 for all i. But can this term vanish, this lambda k plus 1 minus lambda i, can this ever vanish? By your very assumption, these are all distinct eigenvalues. So that lambda k plus 1 is different from any of the aforesaid uh, lambdas, lambda 1 through lambda r. So I can just get rid of this term. Of course, c k plus 1 some constant. So the only conclusion is that C i is equal to 0. Yeah? For all i. And if C i is equal to 0 for all i, then of course C k plus 1 times V k plus 1 can be equal to 0 when V k plus 1 is not 0. If and only if C k plus 1 is also 0. Yeah? So this is for all i including k plus 1. Agreed? So I do not need to really nitpick that point that oh these ci is a 0 only up to 1 through k, what about ck plus 1? Well, from this very equation itself, if the first k ci's vanish, 
and CK plus 1 must also vanish, which means that we have shown that through mathematical induction, if you have distinct eigenvalues, the eigenvectors corresponding to distinct eigenvalues must be linearly independent and by extension therefore if you have all your eigenvalues distinct, all your n eigenvalues distinct for an n by n complex matrix, you are sure to find n linearly independent eigenvectors corresponding to each of these eigenvalues and therefore be able to diagonalize this whole matrix into a diagonal matrix whose diagonal entries are all complex numbers however. You cannot expect them to be all real now, right? Because your eigenvalues are allowed to be complex. We are dealing with algebraically closed fields. Now whether that diagonalization does help, of course it does help. You can just go ahead and perform your calculus and solve for those differential equations treating those complex numbers like any other numbers. But the coefficients will not be real anymore, right? That's the only penalty. So you can have some complex coefficient times e raised to some complex power, not necessarily real power, right? But in principle, mathematically the problem is solved, yes? So determinant has some other, so the question is that what comes first, the determinants or the eigenvalues? In this course, we'll try to keep determinants and to a, to a remote corner and not touch it unless we can't help it as in this case. So we have only used determinants to show that there does exist something like this. But you see the idea of a spectrum of a linear operator, even if it's not over finite dimensional vector spaces is not uh, totally dependent on this determinant, right? Anything that satisfies that equation AV is equal to lambda V is an eigenvalue. Now determinant just gives us a very handy way of evaluating that eigenvalue. Hmm. And in this case, we've just guaranteed the existence over finite dimensional vector spaces using determinants. But the idea of eigenvalues is not predicated on determinants, okay? It's something much more fundamental. As I said, eigen is a German word for keeping the same because it doesn't change the direction. When this acts on that vector, it doesn't do anything other than a scaling. It doesn't rotate the vector. So it stays within the span, okay? We'll see that this idea has profound consequences when we talk about um, some special vector spaces, but maybe not in today's lecture, right? But this idea is very important that when you have distinct eigenvalues, you can always find linearly independent eigenvectors. Does it mean that when you have repeated eigenvalues, you are totally lost and you cannot diagonalize it? Of course not. Just look at the identity matrix in itself. It has all its eigenvalues one and it is diagonal. You have nothing to do. It's already diagonal. So it doesn't mean that if you have repeated eigenvalues, all is lost. But it certainly means that if you have distinct eigenvalues, we can always go ahead and diagonalize such a matrix, okay? We will now, in, in, in the subsequent part of this lecture, take a brief detour, sort of, but we'll see how it again merges together. The reason why I'm taking this detour is because we've also covered inner product spaces, and what I'm going to now talk about is a special case of when we will always be able to diagonalize a particular matrix. So it, you might consider it a little bit of a misfit for this discussion, but nonetheless, it's an interesting, important case. So I'll see if we have time, we'll also talk about a brief little application of this, uh, this diagonalization and this decoupling, okay? Another application apart from the solution of differential equations, but it's a very special case. So that is what it's going to be.